Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar for November 2024. I hope you're all doing well wherever you're watching this from. Uh, my name is Hugh Daigle. I'm the director of the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment. I'm also an associate professor here in the Hildebrand, Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. A little bit of background about what the center is. We are a group of 27 researchers uh, who work on all aspects of subsurface energy. We have a variety of different backgrounds in here and a lot of people doing some very good work. And these webinars are a great way of conveying that great work to you all out there. Research in the center focuses on a variety of different subsurface energy topics, including conventional oil and gas and unconventionals, of course. But we also work on a, a variety of other different things, including gas hydrates, geothermal, CCUS, uh, critical minerals, hydrogen, methane emissions, and uh, fundamental processes and other, other research areas. Um, the technical disciplines involved are quite broad, as you can imagine, from the scope of what we work on. Uh, we have strength in reservoir engineering and data analytics and machine learning, but also petrophysics, which uh, you'll hear about today, a little foreshadowing there, uh, drilling, some geophysics, sustainability, formation evaluation, and other areas. And the engineering tools we use to investigate these problems include simulations, um, macro scale experiments, micro scale experiments, and other types of tools. Much of the research that we do is funded through industrial affiliate programs, which are the university's equivalent of consortia. And you can see the topics listed here. Um, if any of these interest you, I urge you to go to our website for more information and to reach out to the PIs uh, directly. Now, a little bit about our web webinars. Uh, these webinars are intended to be informative to you all. We hope that what we do here is of use to the industry and we want to get the word out about what we do. We host these generally on the second Tuesday of every month at noon central time on Teams. And you can go to our website or LinkedIn page for more inf information about those. We also record the webinars and upload them to our YouTube channel. So if you miss one or you want to go back and rewatch it, you can go up there in a couple of days and it'll be up there. Um, upcoming dates, um, we're not going to have a webinar in December due to the holidays, um, and we will be announcing our lineup for uh, 2025 soon. So keep your eyes um, open for that. Now, we do have sponsorship opportunities for our webinars. Um, this is at a level of $5,000 per webinar, and you'll get your name and your logo prominently at the beginning and end of the webinar. Obviously, this is, gives you access to our live audience of industry, government, and academia. Uh, we publicize these broadly to a variety of different audiences and then post it to YouTube after the live event. And our YouTube channel has over 10,000 views in the last few years, and that's growing uh, quite rapidly. So for you as a sponsor, you reach a global targeted audience, you associate your brand with what we feel is the high quality research and education that we do here, and you also support the center's mission of advancing research and education. So for more information on that, you can reach out to me. Uh, there's my email address and I'd be happy to answer any questions. So without further ado, um, I would like to introduce today's uh, webinar speaker, a couple of housekeeping items before we do. Um, if you have questions, you can please post them in the Q&A section, and we'll get to as many of them as possible at the end of today's webinar. Um, and as I mentioned, we'll upload this presentation to the CSEE YouTube channel within a few days. Now, it's my great pleasure to announce or introduce today's webinar speaker, who is Dr. Zoya Hidari. Um, Dr. Hidari is a professor here in the uh, Hildebrand Department. And uh, she works on uh, formation evaluation, integrating multi-scale analysis. Um, and she runs an IAP on multi-scale uh, rock physics, which has been around for quite a while and uh, is quite successful. She's won a number of awards, um, and we're very fortunate to have her here as a faculty member. So um, anyway, I will pass it off to Dr. Hidari. Thank you very much, Dr. Daigle, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar. Uh, I'm going to talk about unconventional rock analysis today for our uh, evolving energy industry. Uh, so I'm going to start with a quick introduction into my research team and the projects we are working on, and then 
and talk about uh, the challenges in rock analysis and in general for mission evaluation in evolving energy industry. And then uh, I'm going to pick two topics and uh, talk about how we overcome these challenges. <clears throat> Examples of accomplishment uh, around these two topics will be uh, enhanced evaluation of solid fluid interfacial interactions, including wettability and cation exchange capacity. And then on the second part of the presentation, I'm going to talk about enhanced saturation dependent measurements and some new techniques for that purpose. And then during this talk today, I'm going to focus on the importance of integration of experimental work and modeling to overcome some of the challenges we are going to talk about. Uh, during my career, I have been very uh, fortunate uh, to have the opportunity of working with many stellar researchers and and graduate students, uh, both at Texas A&M during uh, the beginning of my career and then later on since 2015 at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, so the credit of uh, most of the research results, uh, indeed all of the results that I'm going to show you today will go to these wonderful graduate students and researchers that I have had, who I have had the opportunity of working with uh, during uh, my career, academic career. Uh, so, uh, in my research group, just a quick introduction uh, to my research group. In my research group, so uh, in my research group, we integrate multi-scale formation data through computational research and experimental research. And I'm going to show you some examples of both uh, in the presentation, in today's presentation. So uh, especially when we are dealing with various extremely heterogeneous formations, uh, something that we deal with in uh, today's uh, energy industry, <coughs> We do need uh, this integration of multi-scale and multi-physics formation data. <clears throat> and we develop new rock physics model and experimental methods for enhanced formation evaluation and reservoir characterization. Uh, unique characteristics of the research that we do in this research group is <clears throat> to integrate geochemistry and multi-scale quantitative rock fabric in formation evaluation and rock physics model development. <clears throat> And I'm going to show you examples of uh, some of these efforts in today's presentation. And the purpose is uh, to enhance petrophysical, compositional, interfacial, mechanical, and geochemical uh, formation properties uh, for the purpose of enhanced completion decisions and storage decisions. We are also um, having some efforts on establishing the role of petrophysics in uh, energy transition, and including projects related to uh, CCUS, hydrogen storage, and, and geothermal related applications. So in my research group, we do believe that we need convention unconventional rock physics models and measurement techniques for evaluation of formations with complex rock physics. And uh, we also believe that integration of multi-scale formation data is required for uh, dealing with uh, some of the challenges we're going to talk about. Now, uh, <clears throat> In today's energy industry, uh, we can face uh, several challenges in uh, dealing with complex rocks, rock fluid systems. And uh, uh, part of this is uh, concerned, uh, rela concerns are related to the rock physics models available out there and some related to the experimental techniques out there for characterization of rocks, subsurface rocks. And I'm going to show you some examples. Uh, <clears throat> of these challenges. So let's take a look at this plot uh, for uh, the purpose of reserves evaluation. So this has been one of the very first uh, challenges and research projects we dealt with in my research group. So in organic rich mud rocks, uh, very tight rocks, uh, including uh, lots of organic content, uh, there is a huge challenge of assessment of reserves. Typically, the log-based assessment of uh, fluid saturation, water saturation overestimates the amount of water. Now, in this plot, you can see an overestimation of water saturation through um, some resistivity-based rock physics models uh, using the logs compared to core measurements. So there are two things involved in here. The reliability of those rock physics models used for assessment of these water saturation estimates. The other thing is the reliability of core measurements out there. Uh, and uh, well, there is uncertainty in both um, 
Now, there are different reasons for uh, these uncertainties in both rock physics models and also experimental approaches, and then I'm going to talk about some of them today. So, for instance, uh, one of the reasons that uh, uh, we see some uncertainty in the outcomes of the models out there, conventional models out there applied to these organic rich rocks is uh, uh, their complex geochemistry. So for instance, in this plot, you see on the y-axis error in estimates of water saturation on the x-axis, we have hydrogen index. And you can see as the thermal maturity of the rock increases from right to left as the hydrogen index decreases, you can see an increase in errors in estimates of water saturation. So it's obviously sharing with us that uh, presence of organic content and the thermal maturity affects the reliability of the rock physics model we use for assessment of reserves. And it is not included in any of the rock physics models we use for this purpose. And uh, that needs to change. So now uh, moving to rock analysis in tight rocks, it's important to quantify fluid mobility and the flow capacity in these rocks. And we know that your chemistry, vetability, rock composition, they all impact fluid flow in organic rich mud rocks. Now, uh, however, in quantification of these uh, properties can be pretty challenging. And there are different reasons for that. Saturation, saturating these samples can be pretty hard. So any saturation dependent measurement can be very challenging. And uh, we might lose actually the sample in the middle of the process. And on the other hand, it is actually pretty time consuming. It, it can take weeks to months to change the saturation of a given sample. It's also challenging to prepare perfectly cut cylindrical samples in these kind of tight uh, mud rocks, for instance. So it is very critical to develop reliable and fast methods for saturating tight and irregular shape core samples. And there's another thing that we are going to talk about today. Now, uh, these days, actually, we also deal with lots of uh, storage related problems, right? So when we are dealing with conventional pores, uh, to a very good extent, the diffusion absorption are well defined, and then fluid flow in conventional pores are well defined, right? But for instance, when we talk about diffusion absorption in unconventional pores, we need to uh, consider a complex composition of the components and uh, solid components we have in the rock, and the complex pore structure over there, and also <clears throat> the different types of fluids uh, inside the pore volume. And well, for instance, a diffusion and the uh, viscous diffusion, pore diffusion and surface diffusion, they all affect the flux. And now laboratory measurements for quantification of these properties are very limited and they come with lots of uncertainty. So they are typically limited to the bulk interactions and <clears throat> And quantification of, for instance, let's say CO2 in the case of CO2 storage, CO2 diffusion in the presence of reservoir fluids can be pretty challenging. So there, are, there is need for both computational research and also experimental research to address some of these challenges. Now, in the first part of this presentation, I'm going to talk about evaluation of solid fluid interfacial interactions uh, in the presence of complex rock composition, uh, both solid and fluid composition. So in uh, one of the very first projects we, we were working on with my team in my research group, we were working on properties of organic content, kerogen in particular in organic rich mud rocks. And we were actually extracting kerogen from these mud rocks to evaluate its properties. So for instance, you can see here the electrical resistivity of pure kerogen as a function of heat treatment temperature. With, <clears throat> which is basically correlated to the thermal maturity. And you can see initial increase and then a sudden decrease, right? When we can actually we could explain the decrease because of the graphitization and increase in aromaticity, but we couldn't explain the first part of this plot, uh, which was an initial increase, right? And here we see two different kerogen samples, one at higher thermal maturity, natural thermal maturity in red, and the other one, uh, purple triangles, is at lower thermal maturity sample. 
So, and you can see this peak appears at different uh, heat treatment temperature, which is equivalent to, to some extent to the thermal maturity of the sample. Now, the only reason we could explain this behavior in the first part of this plot was a change in wettability of the sample. And uh, we could just explain it by the fact that the samples uh, absorb some water, absorb some water from the humidity in the air uh, in, inside the lab. So we had similar experiments uh, uh, for other properties of these pure samples, including dielectric measurements of these isolated kerogen samples. And again, we see the same behavior. For instance, in the case of dielectric constant, we see a decrease and a sudden incre in increase and another for both of these samples for lower thermal maturity and higher thermal maturity. And again, this uh, lowest value of this dielectric constant appear at a certain thermal maturity, which is consistent with the previous case. The same thing actually with Young's modulus measurements on isolated kerogen sample. We again see the same behavior here, actually a decrease in the beginning and an, ex an increase. Again, the only reason we could justify this was the change of wettability and the amount of water that was absorbed on the surface of kerogen samples from the humidity in the air. So then we decided actually to quantify uh, surface properties of kerogen. So in the first part of this presentation today, I'm going to talk about the experimental quantification uh, of the effects of thermal maturity and geochemistry on wettability of kerogen. And then I'm going to talk about development of some uh, new methods for assessment of wettability and other interfacial properties, including cation exchange capacity in rocks with complex composition. And this is actually very important in understanding fluid flow in comp complex rocks. So if we want actually to investigate the ability of these complex samples, uh, what can we do? The first step is isolating these samples and then uh, taking them through synthetic maturation to get a wide range of thermal maturity. And then geochemical analysis, including pyrolysis, maybe XPS measurements, and then wettability quantification. So the first part of the results, I'm going to just show you some contact angle measurements. But later on, I'm going to show you a results of another uh, technique for assessment of wettability. We also perform chlorophore treatment to take out the produced uh, uh, bitumen uh, during the process of uh, synthetic maturation, and we repeat the measurements. Uh, for extraction process, I'm not going to go through the details, but we are going to make a powder out of the sample, and then there is going to be chloroform treatment and some acid treatment to isolate kerogen samples, and we then take these samples through different thermal maturity levels. Now, uh, let me show you some uh, initial results of the wettability tests on these samples. So on the left-hand side, we see a low thermal maturity level kerogen. Um, and it's a water droplet that goes on the so surface of this uh, kerogen sample, and you can see that it spreads on the surface, which shows that this is a water wet. Now, uh, on the right-hand side, we have actually a kerogen sample at a higher thermal maturity, and this is a water droplet, and it doesn't wet the surface, as you can see in here. Then we proved that through this uh, research that kerogen can be water wet at low thermal maturity and can be oil wet, actually, at higher thermal maturity level. So uh, thermal maturity affects the wettability of uh, these pure kerogen samples. Now, here you can see actually on the y-axis the hydrogen index, on the x-axis the contact angle. And uh, this is actually two kerogen samples, A and B, and uh, they have gone through uh, different thermal maturity, synthetic thermal maturity, uh, pro thermal maturation process. So you can see actually as uh, hydrogen index decreases, uh, we see an increase in contact angle, uh, which is actually proving the hypothesis that we had uh, in the beginning uh, of this research project. Now, the question is how to quantify wettability of complex rocks. This was just a, a sample, kerogen sample. Now, uh, if, for instance, when we deal with uh, complex carbonates or organic rich mud rocks, we are dealing with uh, complex rock composition. We also might deal with a special heterogeneity in wettability. And uh, well, we also have a complex pore structure. Uh, how can we accurately quantify the wettability of these types of complex 
systems because when we have different types of minerals, their interest, uh, their affinity to water or different types of fluids that we have in the rock uh, varies around, uh, especially inside the rock. What can we do about that and how? what is the best technique to use for quantification of wettability and surface properties? There are different techniques out there that can be used to quantify uh, wettability, for instance, including contact angle measurements, something like what I showed you as the first results today uh, for pure kerogen samples. But we all know that uh, contact angle measurements work best for pure minerals and uh, well, any sort of contamination surface roughness uh, can affect the measurements significantly. NMR measurements are great options out there as well. However, NMR measurements are sensitive to other things, other properties of the rock. So that naturally makes the results for vetability assessment through NMR measurements kind of non-unique. There are other geophysical measurements as well that are sensitive to vetability. But this non-uniqueness is always part of the problem. Now, imbibition methods are also popular methods, but for, for instance, consider actually these tight rocks. It's actually pretty hard to perform this kind of imbibition based techniques for assessment of wettability. Now, let me show you an example. Here we have actually two rocks, rock A and B, and we are going to get back to these rocks at the end of this part of the presentation. Contact angle measurements as one of them 74%, the other one 64%. They are very different in mineralogy, but contact angle measurements approximately give you similar uh, wettability, right? Now, if I expose this to water vapor and let them absorb water as much as water as they want, uh, we can see actually pretty different water absorption in these two samples. And so the absorption level is different demonstrated they, they have actually different wettability levels. And this is actually pretty obvious from the mineralogy as well. However, for instance, a method like contact angle measurement cannot quantify. So let's, do, let's take a look at other ways of quantifying these surface properties. And uh, I'm going to show you some results for uh, concept of absorption uh, to quantify wettability of complex rocks. Now, uh, when uh, liquid is in contact with a solid surface uh, at a certain temperature and pressure, the extent of absorption is assumed to be related to the interaction between the solid and the fluid. The degree of hydrophilicity of the surface will greatly uh, influence the absorption process. And we're going to use this concept to quantify both wettability and cation exchange capacity. So, what shall we do? How can we start the process in this kind of research? So we start actually with preparing some samples. We first actually perform some measurements on pure components in a given rock, including non-clay minerals, clay minerals, and let's say if you have an organic rich uh, rock, we also perform measurements on kerogen. And then we create a kind of a controlled situation and we uh, prepare samples, we change the wettability uh, synthetically. For instance, in the case of quartz, we create synthetic wettability uh, ranging from water wet to oil wet. Uh, and then uh, we create pellets if the samples are in powder form and we measure uh, water absorption isotherms. Uh, now, after this phase on the pure minerals, we need to actually, uh, in a controlled environment, we have to actually create mixtures of different minerals to see what happens if I have uh, <clears throat> a mixture of different minerals with different wettability levels. So we create mixtures and then we measure water absorption isotherms again, and then we look into the results together today. So let me actually show you one first example on the sensitivity. Here is, <clears throat> Water absorption isotherm here on the y-axis, I have absorbed amount of water, and on the x-axis is relative humidity. <clears throat> now, uh, the red uh, curves show the water wet quartz and the oil, and the red and the, the blue curves show the water wet quartz and the red curves show the oil wet quartz, <clears throat> both absorption and desorption. Uh, there are actually multiple things that we see in this plot. In the case of uh, the water wet quartz, we can see actually the area below this curve. 
is more than the case of oil bed quartz and it absorbs more water. It's water wet and it makes sense. The other thing that I would like to uh, highlight in here is the shape of these adsorption curves. Adsorption and desorption curves are different in the case of water wet uh, sample and the oil wet sample. So uh, in the case of water wet sample, we see a type uh, four and uh, in the case of uh, oil wet sample, we see a type five uh, isotherm curve. Now, if I actually measure contact angle, uh, put a water droplet on the surface of both these samples, uh, in the case of water wet case, it spreads completely on the surface. And in the case of oil wet case, you can see uh, that it has a, a high value for a contact angle that demonstrates as an oil wet system. So that was actually one of the first experiments we performed. Now, uh, <clears throat> In the second case that I'm going to show you here is the sensitivity of water absorption isotherm to mineral type. Uh, so in this case, you can see actually multiple types of minerals here, kelonite, elite, chloride, uh, water wet quartz, calcite, and montmorillonite. And it's obvious that montmorillonite here has the highest absorption uh, values in here, and the others actually look like all collapsing on top of each other, but it's not the case. If we zoom in, you can see that the water absorption isotherms can distinguish the wettability of these minerals as well. Now, in all of them, if I perform, uh, if we perform contact angle measurements, the water droplet spreads all uh, over the surface, and you cannot really distinguish these different wettability levels using contact angle measurements. Now let's go back to our kerogen samples. Now we have kerogen samples in three formations, A, B, and C. Here you can see the hydrogen index and total organic carbon content reported in here. Uh, uh, formation A has the highest uh, hydrogen index and the lowest thermal maturity. Formation C has the lowest hydrogen index, highest thermal maturity. And you can see contact angle measurements uh, are also confirming uh, that at uh, low, lowest thermal maturity, I have the uh, lowest contact angle at highest thermal maturity. As the thermal maturity increases, contact angle increases as well. Now, let's actually uh, perform some uh, water absorption isotherms and see how water absorption isotherms can distinguish the availability of these samples. Here we have formation A, B, and C. A in black, B in blue, and uh, uh, C in red. And you can see water absorption isotherms are extremely different in uh, three formations. Now, if I want to quantify uh, the absorbed amount of water, I can actually integrate the area below these curves up to 60% relative humidity. And you can see for formation A uh, is uh, highest compared to the rest. And formation A is the least thermally mature uh, sample that we had uh, among uh, among all. Now, uh, I would like actually to uh, mention one thing about kerogen, presence of kerogen. Uh, here on the right hand side, we see the comparison of uh, water absorption isotherm in a water wet quartz sample, and uh, uh, the triangles uh, represent kerogen, and the circles represent sodium montmorillonite. You can see the amount of absorbed water on the surface of kerogen is extremely high, and it's obviously it's actually less than sodium montmorillonite, but you can see it can have a huge contribution uh, to the wettability of organic rich mud rocks. So, indeed, actually, clays and kerogen can be key components controlling the bedding behavior of rocks, and obviously. The thermal maturity of kerogen played a role as well, but since it contains actually a big volume concentration in the rock, it needs to be taken into account. Now, let's see if I can actually assess wettability of rocks based on water absorption. So uh, the rocks can have very complex composition, and can we use the water absorption isotherms to quantify wettability of rocks with complex composition? So now, to answer this question, let's create some synthetic samples to start with. So here we have, uh, for instance, a mixture of calcite and oil wet quartz, kelonite plus oil wet quartz, and then elite plus water wet quartz. So basically the purpose is synthetically create samples to in a controlled environment to see 
if the method works. So upper limit and lower limit here actually uh, shows the pure elements and in the middle the water absorption isotherm for the pure elements components in the rock a synthetic rock and what we have in the middle in black triangles in all these three cases is the uh, water absorption isotherm of the compo uh, of the mixture and you can see that the <clears throat> Uh, water absorption isotherms are sensitive to the wetting behavior of the minerals as well as their concentration in samples containing more than one mineral. Now let's see actually if we can predict this. So we have an effective medium model and uh, to see if we can uh, predict uh, or analytically estimate the experimentally measured uh, absorption isotherms. So, so these uh, black triangles is the experimental measurements on the mixtures and then uh, the red uh, squares and show the analytical the results of the analytical model to mix the um, to uh, to estimate actually the wettability of the mixture so what absorption is the term of mixtures can be estimated based on the properties of pure components now let's go back uh, to those two formation a and b samples that i showed you in the beginning of this presentation so we have actually a very complex composition in these two samples, these are two organic rich mud rocks, and uh, the composition is very different in these two, formation A and formation B. Now, let's actually, these are actual rock samples. After creating synthetic samples, we move on to actual samples, and we quantify water absorption isotherm in these two samples. Let's start with formation A. So we have four subsamples in formation A, and let's and take a look at the water absorption isotherm. So in most of the cases, in the three of four samples, they almost overlap, the water absorption isotherms overlap. And uh, in uh, one of them, uh, sample A3, uh, it's a little bit different uh, than the other three samples. And if you look at actually the properties, you can see that the TUC is actually less than the other three samples in subsample A3. And well, again, actually it confirms the sensitivity of these water absorption isotherms to the amount of kerogen that we have in these rocks. Now, in the case of formation B, we can see actually the uh, water absorption isotherms fall below uh, the ones that we measured for uh, formation A, showing actually a lower vetability to water compared to formation A. So we can see water absorption isotherms are sensitive to the composition of these organic rich mud rocks and then can distinguish the vetability of these rocks. Now let's take a look at the contact angle measurements. So for formation A, we see values between 71 to 100. And again, you can see the contact angle in 83 is also different and then the other three samples. Uh, and uh, which is which is actually confirming the water absorption isotherm measurements as well. But in sample B, subsamples from formation B, the contact angle measurements is almost around the same value as formation A. Basically, contact angle measurement here cannot distinguish the vetability of these two formations and the subsamples in these two formations, but the water absorption isotherms could distinguish. Now, can we use the same concept? for assessment of other interfacial properties, such as cation exchange capacity. So assessment of cation exchange capacity in the lab can be very challenging with the existing techniques. Can we use the absorption concept to quantify it? Uh, well, many years ago, actually, with uh, one of my PhD students, uh, Dr. Kai Cheng, uh, we investigated this matter. And so I'm not going to go through the details, but, but I'm going to show you some interesting results about this. So uh, this, uh, when we expose actually clay minerals to water, the, uh, well, we can have swelling and hydration happening. So if we calculate the change in electric potential energy and change in chemical potential, and we put them in balance, so we would be able actually to estimate cation exchange capacity. And the details of this technique are documented in the papers we published on this work. So. Uh, let me show you the outcome of this uh, in the two formations I just we just talked about, formation A and B. We performed actually these measurements and assessment of cation exchange capacity in the same formations. So on the left-hand side, I have the results from formation A. 
So on the y-axis, we have cation exchange capacity estimates using the new method based on uh, adsorption concept, and the x-axis is the results from membrane potential, which is a conventional techniques for assessment of uh, cation exchange capacity. So on the left-hand side, we have these estimates for formation A. For on the right-hand side, we have these estimates for formation B. And you can see the errors uh, are less than 10% and 7% in these. So we, we could actually estimate cation exchange capacity pretty reliably with this uh, technique. And I want to draw your attention to another concept as well in here. You can see the cation exchange capacity in formation A was much higher than uh, formation B, and it is consistent indeed with the vetability results uh, that we uh, had earlier. Now, <clears throat> the conclusion out of the first part of this presentation was uh, really that the vetability uh, of kerogen uh, and honoring geochemistry of kerogen is important. The information evaluation of organic rich matrix needs to be quantified because it changes with thermal maturity. And it might also affect actually the water production in organic rich mud rocks. And we have done some interesting uh, research about that as well. And we have proved that it affects uh, water production and hydrocarbon production in organic rich mud rocks. So it needs to be reliably quantified and taken into account in uh, completion decision making. And there are many other ways actually to calculate vetability that uh, needs to be investigated. And one of them is the concept of adsorption. And we showed that it can actually enhance actually vetability assessment. Uh, we provide a final resolution and it can be used for both assessment of vetability and cation exchange capacity. Now, I mostly talked about experimental work, but this work can be actually integrated with some computational research uh, to enhance the range of uh, investigation in terms of pressure and temperature as well. For instance, some molecular scale modeling can significantly enhance the outcomes of this work and is critical for understanding larger scale fluid flow and physical properties uh, of the rocks. And it, it also enables development of new methods for controlling solid fluid interfacial properties. Uh, other interfacial properties that are important to be quantified, for instance, and uh, that can benefit from this integration of <coughs> experimental and digital molecular scale modeling would be the mobility of ions, for instance, let's say uh, around the surface of the minerals, including clay minerals, right? It's a very important property to be considered when we are modeling, for instance, electromagnetic response in rocks with complex composition, right? So and uh, <clears throat> this kind of integration of experimental and computational work can enhance assessment of diffusivity and mobility of ions around the interfaces, right? Or for instance, in low salinity water flooding, what happens at the interface? This kind of modeling are required really for understanding solid fluid interfacial interactions, uh, which is hard or impossible to be quantified experimentally. I would like to highlight another application in here, which is about uh, quantification of CO2 adsorption, diffusion, and leakage, right? Uh, we talked about it in the very beginning. Uh, when uh, we have a complex composition, complex fluids, it's really important actually to quantify diffusivity, adsorption, all of those. And uh, it, it might be hard sometimes experimentally. So experimental results should be integrated with some modeling efforts. And let me show you a quick example of uh, uh, such kind of modeling efforts. For instance, let's say that we have a kerogen matrix in here. Since we have been talking about kerogen, I'm showing you an example of a kerogen. And we have some porous space inside kerogen. And let's say we have a channel in between. So uh, in the beginning uh, here, uh, this is actually the CO2 density in here, and then there we have different layers. Uh, the, and uh, CO2 uh, density can be different in the kerogen matrix in the near uh, surface region and also in, in the channel, right? And then you can calculate actually diffusivity in uh, different regions through these kind of models, which can be pretty hard to achieve this with experimental work. Now, if the shape of the pore changes from channel to, for instance, let's say cylindrical type of pore, again, uh, with this kind of modeling, we can uh, quantify the diffusivity, which is pretty important in uh, quantification of uh, flux uh, in this kind of uh, situation in the presence of CO2 reservoir fluids and also complex matrix composition. 
Now, for instance, if uh, we want to consider actually other uh, components, reservoir fluids inside the rock, for instance, here in the presence of resin. So you see in the initial condition, let's say all the CO2 is inside this channel, right? But after, uh, after a while, you can see CO2 goes inside uh, kerogen pore space, right? And the concentration of CO2 in the channel decreases and it goes inside the kerogen matrix. And now with a different concentration of res resin, you can see the concentration of CO2 in the channel and inside kerogen matrix changes as well, right? So here you can see, for instance, increasing resin saturation uh, can uh, change CO2 absorption can reduce CO2 absorption, CO2 bulk diffusion, surface diffusion, and also matrix diffusion. And all of these can be quantified and somehow impossible in many cases uh, through experimental work. So this kind of integration is really critical. Now, in the second part of this presentation, very quickly, I would like to talk about saturation-dependent measurements, as I mentioned in the beginning, which is very important, especially in tight rocks and also uh, in the presence of uh, different types of fluids that we deal with in today in our today's industry challenges. Now, there are actually two factors that I would like to highlight in here. Time factor, because in very, when we have actually tight rocks, uh, uh, it might require actually weeks and days to saturate the sample or change the saturation of a given sample, right? And the other thing is a shape factor because in many cases, we lose sample during coring process in the middle of experiments. The sample might break or crack or chips off, and then it will be useless, right? So we need to develop saturation process for irregular shape samples, for both improving the time, make them faster, and then uh, for irregular shape samples. Otherwise, the saturation-dependent measurements in core samples would not be very efficient, especially when we deal with fractured rocks, when we deal with tight sample. So <clears throat> for that purpose, uh, we are going to introduce an enhanced, uh, I'm going to talk about an enhanced saturation process that one of my PhD students introduced in, in our research group. So we start with preparing the samples for the saturation process, initial analyzing and quantifying saturation, gravimetric technique, NMR techniques to quantify the saturation. Now, if we have irregular shape samples, we need to figure out actually the uh, shape of the sample and the volume of the sample. For that purpose, we do micro CT scan imaging of the sample. We estimate the pore volume of the sample using helium porosimetry as well. Now, we uh, have a, an updated saturation setup where uh, we have a chamber a sample hold, holder and we have a piston that goes inside and apply pressure and we basically inject fluid from all uh, directions to a sample, to a given sample. It can be actually a cylindrical sample, it can be a cylindrical sample with a hole, multiple holes, or it can be any irregular shaped sample, right? Any broken rock or any uh, cuttings, if uh, it's applicable to cuttings as well. And then after the process, we uh, perform gravimetric and NMR measurements again on the saturated sample for saturation monitoring. And we see if, if we check if we have changed the saturation or not. Uh, and then uh, we might actually consider increasing the pressure or uh, changing the saturation and continue uh, the saturation process to achieve actually different levels of saturation depending on application, right? Until actually we cannot change the volume of the water inside the sample anymore, water or any other fluids pollute in the sample anymore, and that's the end of the saturation process. Now, let me show you some results actually. This is a cylindrical sample, extremely tight sample, and I'm gonna report to you the permeability of the sample in few minutes as well. So uh, let me show you some uh, saturation results. You can see uh, uh, we start with 1000 PSI and the volume of injection brine increases rapidly. Uh, it's actually a very uh, a rapid increase in the volume of water. And then uh, we decided actually to increase the pressure a little bit more and inject a little bit more water into the sample and we could saturate the sample up to uh, above 60%. It's an extremely tight sample. And then in the second case, sample number two, we create a hole to hopefully increase the saturation process. 
Again, you can see actually it's a very rapid increase in water saturation. We increase the pressure and uh, we further increase the saturation. Now, uh, before continuing to irregular shape sample, let me compare the results about some conventional ways of increasing saturation. So here on the y-axis, we have water saturation. On the x-axis, uh, we have sample one and sample two, right, with the enhanced saturation process. And then sample three and sample four are through a spontaneous imbibition and vacuum saturation. And you can see the time, the amount of water achieved uh, with the enhanced saturation pro process is much higher than uh, the other two cases. Now, if I want to compare the time taken for this saturation, we have to actually compare uh, the time for achieving a certain saturation level. And we choose here 18% because the conventional saturation techniques could saturate the samples up to 18%. So you can see that significantly lower times, uh, less time is needed for saturating samples one and two compared to the conventional techniques. Now, uh, sample five and sample six are irregular shape. You can see that is a broken piece of rock and and uh, we quantify the volumes through CT scan imaging. So uh, this is again the saturation process, volume of injected brine, and you can see uh, that uh, uh, saturation process could uh, increase the saturation level in the sample. And this is actually on the other sample, another bro broken sample, and in this case, we also could achieve uh, up to 60% saturation, which couldn't be possible with the conventional techniques. Uh, and sample five and six, we see uh, much less time uh, needed for saturating the samples. Uh, in, the, in the case of sample five, uh, with the irregular shape sample, uh, which is an irregular shape sample uh, through enhanced saturation process, and sample six is kind of a mixture of both. Now, the purpose of changing the saturation was assessment of uh, relative permeability indeed, right? So we need to do something about relative permeability. So uh, we actually monitor pressure decay uh, for the case of helium uh, in these type samples. Now, in the case of regular shape samples, we have no problem with uh, analyzing this uh, pressure decay. In the case of irregular shape samples, however, we have to solve diffusion equation uh, even in the case where we have, uh, we create a hole in the sample. And then uh, the input to this uh, solver will be actually the properties uh, of the rock and, and properties of the fluids that are being used. And we also use CT scan imaging to get uh, the shape of the sample and create a numeric grid to solve this diffusion equation over there. And so we estimate uh, permeability through this technique. We have a measured permeability. We minimize a cost function to be able to optimize the permeability. Uh, so and then uh, eventually we have the permeability. Now uh, I'm just going to show uh, the results of uh, two samples in here for uh, the relative permeability measurements. This is a relative permeability as a function of water saturation. And you can see that we could get uh, the relative permeability up to 65% saturation levels. Now, imagine that if I had actually a conventional technique and I could only saturate the sample to very low values, I had to extrapolate the rest of these points, which wouldn't give me a reliable relative permeability care. Another thing that we have to monitor in here is the saturation profile inside the sample. For instance, in a cylindrical sample here, we monitor the a saturation profile, and we have to make sure that it is uniform, right? We may need to make sure that the gases are not, for instance, trapped in the middle of the sample, and we have monitored that it was not a problem. And that's another advantage of this technique that we can uh, get a relatively uniform uh, saturation throughout the length of the sample. Now, uh, let's actually compare the time uh, one more time. So regarding the enhanced saturation process, really the time that it takes for saturate the sample is minimal compared to the conventional techniques, let's say spontaneous imbibition in this case. Uh, permeability experiments uh, were relatively the, uh, the same, but the main difference is the saturation process. Now, if you look into this uh, time difference in the logarithmic scale, it would be easier to see um, 
the change really in the uh, saturation process, the time needed for the saturation process. And the, the maximum attainable saturation is obviously different in the case of enhanced saturation process compared to the spontaneous inhibition. So in general, actually, the time is actually a, a very important component in here that is decreased. And at the same time, it, it, this process enables and making measurements on any irregular shape sample. And that's actually the true benefit of this technique. And uh, the maximum saturation levels that we could achieve was independent of the shape of the sample. That was another advantage. So here, actually, we demonstrated that the integration of numerical modeling and experimental measurements uh, could enable analysis of irregular shape rock samples and uh, hopefully cuttings in the future in the laboratory that really brings value to this. And a new core analysis methods and standards and regulations are needed for these rock types. And this is what we are doing here uh, in this research group. So in some final words is that integration of unconventional experimental measurements and uh, data analysis methods and computational modeling is truly required for reliable rock analysis and formation evaluation of challenging rock fluid systems, both in the presence of composition of the solid components and the fluids and also uh, the pore network. Uh, finally, I would like to uh, acknowledge the contribution of all the sponsors of our research consortium, uh, which made uh, accomplishment of this research outcomes possible. Well, thank you very much for attending this presentation. I will be happy to answer some questions. So just a reminder, if you have questions, you can type them in the Q&A, please, and we'll get some of this that come in. So here's one. Uh, based on what you said about kerogen wettability in organic-rich mud rocks, wouldn't it be detrimental to hydrocarbon production if we expose the rocks to water through fracturing flu fluids? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, so um, indeed, it can be. Uh, depending on the thermal maturity of the sample. So in another research project, we have demonstrated how the kerogen structure, chemical structure and bonds change when they expose, when it's exposed to water. And depending on the thermal maturity, it can hold tight and to water molecules and uh, then it can expand, the molecule can expand and stretch. And well, uh, that can potentially cause um, some blockage of the pores and uh, well that can uh, somehow to some extent uh, explain uh, the water production in organic rich models depending on thermal maturity and uh, sometimes actually it can also um, clarify the reason behind uh, some low recovery factor depending on the uh, technique we use uh, for production. So yes, uh, in some cases, it can potentially affect the production when we expose the formation to excess water through fracturing fluids. So regarding your modeling work on CO2 and methane adsorption and diffusion, do you have any plans for experimental verification? And can that work be expanded to hydrogen adsorption and leakage quantification? Um, well, I showed you some uh, um, computational molecular scale modeling work uh, for the case of CO2, and I didn't show you any experimental verification, but uh, the answer is yes. It can be done uh, verified experimentally. And now <clears throat> one of my uh, PhD students uh, is working on some experimental verification through some new technique of quantification of adsorption and diffusion uh, of CO2. Um, <clears throat> the second part of the question was regarding hydrogen. So uh, I didn't show you any results uh, about hydrogen, but uh, yes, this modeling can be done for different types of fluids uh, in contact with the surface. And then, yes, uh, we, this is a similar thing can be done for the case of hydrogen. Uh, indeed, actually, we have a publication about that as well. OK. The outcomes definitely will be different. But uh, yes, a similar approach can be done for hydrogen. OK, great. So regarding the relative permeability measurement work, um, 
what can be done if the sample breaks in the middle of the experiment or the saturation process? Well, uh, that's a nice thing about this technique that if uh, the sample breaks, uh, uh, well, obviously, actually, they don't have the initial shape of the sample, but uh, and the method works for any irregular shape sample, and we can continue. Indeed, one of the uh, samples that we were working on, one of the cylindrical samples we were working on uh, during uh, the measurements, broke in the middle of the saturation process, and it happens a lot. Uh, that uh, cracks open and then the sample breaks. We can continue the saturation process with that uh, regular shape sample. The only thing we need to do is an extra step of micro CT scanning of the sample to update the volume of the sample and, and then to update the pore volume that is accessible to uh, different fluids that we are injecting. And uh, that's actually a nice thing about this technique that the measurements can continu continue in the conventional way of uh, performing this saturation process and uh, making measurements when a sample breaks, it's we are done. We are waste, uh, our time is wasted for the past uh, multiple months of saturation and measurement process, right? But in this particular case, we can continue with the measurements.